Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of You Press Play Sports. I'm your host, Richard Barrera, and joining me today is sports editor Cameron Priester and staff writer Zachary Watts. Hey, guys, how's it been going? Uh, good as of late. Uh, you know, not the most exciting news as our win streak came to an end for FA basketball, but there's a lot of things to look at within that game. So, you know, I'm more than excited to kind of break down what's gone right, what's went wrong. Um, and not to mention we have baseball season just around the corner. So hopefully we can get the preview out here shortly. But yeah, a lot of interesting sports topics to cover today. Yeah, a lot of good stuff. Sucks that um, the streak ended, but it had to end sometime. So but there's a lot of other good stuff to talk about. So I'm ready to uh, get into it. Yeah, definitely. And while we will hold off on baseball until next week, uh, until our next episode, uh, we will look at men's basketball uh, first. And of course, as Zach mentioned, their program record 20 game winning streak came to an end Thursday night, last Thursday against UAB on the road, uh, a place where they haven't won a game in throughout their time against the Blazers uh, uh, in Birmingham. And this game was pretty much the same, despite their efforts. They fell 86-77 against the UAB squad who just got back their best offensive player in Jordan Walker, um, who came off the bench in that game, actually. So it, it, it's a tough loss, but luckily they did bounce back with a very good 67-52 victory against the Charles 49ers. A great defensive performance, only allowing 52 points. Uh, but however, the AAP Top 25 decided to have them fall off. Uh, out of the rankings just they're just outside like at 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 the moment they're probably in like top 30 like just outside the top 25 but yeah i think, no I think long- it was like they had 93 votes and then the next team had like 96 it was like wow so close yeah it's 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 very unfortunate to see them fall out of the top 25 like that despite some losses from teams closer to their rank to close to those rankings but hey there's always a great chance to bounce back and re-enter the rankings once again. And so, guys, I want to know your thoughts on the winning streak ending and falling out of the rank, falling out of the AP Top 25 poll, and, like, what else can FEU do to keep bouncing back? Yeah, so for the most part, um, just for the basis of the rankings, I'll say – you know, a lot of people definitely don't have a ton of respect for mid-major conferences outside of like Gonzaga, who I don't even consider a mid-major team. But, you know, it it's really hard to maintain your spot in the rankings, but you have to keep winning. And, you know, people were waiting on us to slip up one time and that's all it took. It took for one loss for them to kick us out of the rankings. But, you know, I still have high hopes for um, our selection coming up for the tournament. I still have high hopes in that regard top 25 doesn't mean much to me. You don't get an award or a trophy just because you finish within the top 25. So I don't have any strong feelings towards that. As for the basis of the game itself and how our win streak came to an end, you know, it, it just, a lot of things weren't falling our way, you know, especially late in the stretch. We, we tend to be slower in the first half, or even if we aren't slow in the first half, we're just so much stronger in the second half due to rotational uh, depth, guys coming off the bench, playing a huge part. But it's really hard to win games when you're eight from 36 from the three-point line. You know, our shots just weren't falling behind the arc. And, you know, what I even loved is even though we struggled in that regard, the very next game against Charlotte, which we ended up winning, we were not afraid at all to shoot beyond the arc. So it just goes to show that just because we had a bad game in one regard doesn't mean we're going to completely switch the game plan or we're going to fall away from what made us so great up until this point. I will give credit where credit is due on UAB side of things. They played exceptionally well defensively with their defense. Uh, defensive help rotationally they had a lot of help inside that forced us to put up a lot of three pointers even though that's probably what we didn't want to settle on um so that ended us ended up hurting us in the long run i'm pretty sure though uab ended up going to the line uh 31 times that game so they were 26 for 31 from the line that also does not help at all but with all that being said you know if i were to tell you we were eight for 36 from three and we gave up 31 free throws but we only lost by nine points, you would say we did an exceptional job at covering that margin. You know, we still made it a very competitive game throughout. So, you know, there's a lot of good to take away from that. And I'm honestly glad we got to see some of our weaknesses because, 
you know, when you get down to the tournament, you're going to be facing the best of the best and you got to be able to identify what you need to improve on if you want to make a good run. And in our case, a Cinderella run, as some would say. Um, just looking at the, the fall from the rankings first, what I'll say is that it, that's, that's just because what's going to happen. If, if you pay attention to college basketball, you'll know like the voters in the AP poll, they're looking for any reason whenever there's like a team like FAU in there, any reason to get them out. So as soon as FAU lost that game, we kind of knew that was going to happen. They could have beat Charlotte by like 115. They weren't going to be in the rankings this week. Um, but looking at the UAB game specifically, um, the streak just had to end. You know, it, 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 we knew it was going to end. They weren't just going to win out through the national championship. <laughs> um that was that and it just as happened to be that works. night as much and as we there's a there was a chance but um that that just wasn't gonna happen and it, it wasn't FAU's night it seemed like the shots just weren't falling for FAU and then every shot was falling for UAB that's that's what's gonna happen but the fact that they were just quickly able to regroup and kind of uh, especially in the second half against uh Charlotte they really they, they looked a little shaky in the first half went down into halftime, but to come out like that in the second half after like coming off a game like that and then a uh, shaky first half tells me all I need to know about this team. I I don't let's not let's not panic. It sucks that the streak's over, but let's not panic. We got two big conference games at home coming up. Let's not panic. This is this is still the same team from before. The streak had to end eventually. Yeah, and I completely understand that. This team, they are not pretenders. They are for real. And their bounce back win against Charlotte showed us that. Like, you're not really going to see them lose that often this season. And we're just going to keep, we're just going to continue to see them win. And hopefully they can start off another streak of winning great, winning games as they take on Rice in a Battle of the Owls matchup on Thursday at 7 p.m. at home in the borough. And then taking on Louisiana Tech Saturday afternoon on February 11th. So best of luck to them. And hopefully they can also extend their winning streak at home to 16, which would be an actual record for them. They could tie it with a win over Rice and then beating Louisiana Tech would set a new record with home with their home winning streak. So best of luck to them and go Owls. And moving on from men's basketball, we head on to women's basketball. They did go 50-50 on, from their last two games last weekend. Um, they did beat UAB 80-75 to on Thursday, uh, on opposite to their uh, men's basketball counterparts, and but couldn't keep it up as they only scored 59 points in a 73-59 loss to Charlotte last Saturday, so... Still up and down at the moment. They have a 20, 12 and 10 record, five and eight in conference play, uh, inconsistent offense as a whole. Um, what are your guys' thoughts on how they should be able to like maintain consistency, especially as their season gets close to the end? Um, for the most part, I would just say, uh, first, let's address the strengths. Um, you know, I think team rebounding has been a huge point of emphasis for this team throughout the year. I think we do a phenomenal job of out rebounding teams offensively and defensively. Um, I'd like to see more second chance points despite, because even though we're getting rebounds on the offensive side of things, it just seems like we aren't converting them as much as we need to. In terms of the UAB game more specifically, you know, we were able to pull out a win in that regard, but we kind of got help in the same way that UAB was helped in the men's side of things with the free throw shooting. You know, we went to the line 30 times, we were able to convert a lot of those. So it's always good to convert your um, foul opportunities, your foul shot opportunities, excuse me. From the scoring side of things, you know, we talk about offensive inconsistency, but I will say one uh, lady in particular that stepped up huge was Anaya Hubbard. Uh, she had 28 points in the win over UAB and yeah. was also the leading scorer with 19 uh, in the loss against Charlotte. So she's done her part, I'd say, offensively. It's just, you know, basketball is a team game. We always talk about it. You know, there's five people on the court. Everyone has to step up or anyone can step up any given night. So, you know, we don't want to let her efforts go unrecognized. She's playing phenomenally well. Um, I just feel like offensively we still need to figure out some things, whether it be three-point shooting, just being a little more consistent offensively with in terms of second chance points i think we can improve in those regards and there's still enough time to you know we're 12 and 10 we are sitting above 500 so we know what it takes to win 
we are winning basketball teams in terms of winning percentage. Um, it's just going to take some sorting out. Yeah. Um, looking at the UAB game, it was – they kind of returned to, like, the team that we saw, like, towards the beginning of the season. Everything we talked about on the last episode, like, the things they need to improve on, um, they did. They spread the ball around. Anaya Hubbard had 28. Uh, Jada Moore, who's been – very, very quietly efficient, I think, all year. She had 14. Joy Maddox had 10. Rosenthal had 7. That's that's what we talked about. They got started early. I think they shot like 40% from the floor in the first quarter. Um, and then and, and ended up in a pretty solid win. Um, but all of that just seemed to kind of disappear on Saturday against Charlotte. Um, just bad shooting performance. I think it was like 0% from 3 in – second and the fourth quarter and like below 30 percent and it was it was a bad shooting night they were able to like spread the ball around a little bit I think they had like you said a Nye Hubbard had 19 and then two with 12 but um it, it was it just wasn't a, it was very hot and cold from Thursday to Saturday to go from such a strong performance and just especially on offense and on Saturday you just you just can't go hot and cold like that especially at this point in the season you want to be rolling from game to game. Um, and it, it's just not going to get any easier as we finish the season and into the conference tournament. So, you know, hopefully they can fix the consistency. Um, but it's got to happen now. Yeah, definitely. And I do, like, see consistency on the defensive end. While it is questionable at times, it is at the very least consistent. I think the main issue is that they have to be more consistent offensively. Like, whoever's scoring beside, outside of Anaya Hubbard, uh, like, would, we need to see more contribution with this school, with scoring from other players and, you know, just have a more collective effort when it comes to finding the right shots and, you know, making them, you know, like, making the right plays as a whole. And they can do that uh, with this two-game road trip as they head out to Houston, Texas to take home Rice a Thursday at 8, February 9, and then... Louisiana Tech in Ruston, Louisiana, Saturday, February 11th. So best of luck to them on their two-game road trip. And with that, that will conclude our section with FU Sports. Now we head on to national sports. And we're going to start off with the NFL, as this Sunday is the Super Bowl between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Philadelphia Eagles. How many of them are their two-star quarterbacks in Patrick Mahomes and Jalen Hurts as they are the first Two as this is the first Super Bowl that stars two black quarterbacks. So guys, uh, I know I want to know your your takes and your predictions on what will go down for the Super Bowl and who will come out on top and who will take home a, a Super Bowl MVP. Well, I'd say most of the headlines that I've been seeing are more catered around either you know the Kelsey brothers and having their whole family being torn apart with this Super Bowl. I've also seen a lot of a lot more headlines being garnered towards the Eagles. You know, I'm not really seeing a ton of things towards the Chiefs. Maybe it's just because my lack of social media feed in that regard. But you know, I'm, I'm not seeing a ton of stuff for the Chiefs outside of Patrick Mahomes injury. You know, he's been fully healthy and part fully healthy and participating in practice. So, you know, you'd want him to play in one of the biggest games that matters. You never want to see anyone left out of a game such as this. But you know, my expectation for the game, I think the Eagles are a better team overall. However, with officiating and how things have gone this year, I'm not comfortable enough on betting on anyone, if I'm being honest. I just don't think I can sit here comfortably and say, yeah, we're going to have a fair game throughout, and I'm totally not going to question some of the officiating that's going to take place during probably the most important game of the year. So, I don't know. I it hurts that I'm this pessimistic about it because I do just want to sit down and enjoy a game, but it feels like what I've been viewing recently from the product of the NFL, I can't ignore the fact that I've been heavily disappointed from what we've gotten so far. So in that regard, I will keep optimism in the case that these are two talented teams and they're going to play their best football, but I am going to remain a little pessimistic in the aspect of officiating will probably play some part in deciding this outcome. I'm going to be um, a little bit annoying here and maybe hold off on a prediction because it really kind of it, – it's, it's a hard game to call because, like Zach said, the Eagles, I think, are 
more a more built better roster um this unit for unit i think they, they they match up a lot better than kansas city does but at the same time we like we sh- you can't take for granted the fact that they're facing arguably the greatest quarterback of all time and players like that can you know lift you out of you know outmatch situations we've seen it in games like this all the time um I'm I'm leaning more towards Eagles right now, but with Patrick Mahomes and like Zach said, god awful officiating, it's such like a wild card to call right now that if anyone were to be like, Oh, I'm taking Chiefs, I'm taking Eagles, I'm like, you know what? You got that. So I'm gonna I might hold off, but if I had to like give a lean, I'm maybe leaning Eagles, but that's by no way set in stone. Yeah, and well, I'll hold off on calling Patrick Mahomes the greatest quarterback. Uh, until- arguably. Ar- arguably, yeah, sure. But I would uh, – I think that the better argument can be made that he has the best start as a young quarterback in NFL history. Like, he's made it at the very least a conference championship, what, every season he has played in so far? Uh, at the very least, the conference championship. Yeah. Like, know about the Super Bowl appearances. He – beat the 49ers for his first one, then lost to Tampa Bay in the second one. And this is his third Super Bowl appearance after, like, four four seasons. That, if he I, wins this one, he's well on He's well on his way. Yeah, uh, as far as I'm certain, this is the best start a, a young quarterback could ever have in his NFL career. And Patrick Mahomes should be very happy that he has accomplished that much in that um, in that in that such a short amount of time. With that being said, I I do uh, I do agree with you guys um, with choosing the Eagles. Um, I do think they have the better balance, and I think they burst onto the scene quite surprisingly. I don't think people were expecting expecting them to have the start that they had, being the only team to go undefeated after the first couple of games before it, it end ultimately ended. And at full strength, they they are the best team in this league. And while the Chiefs are a close second, because Patrick Mahomes can take them as as anywhere anywhere as they as they want him to take them so it's a very tough call but i would go with the eagles if if i had to really choose but yeah i think jalen hurts will come come top come on top with the super bowl mvp and patrick mahomes um you know he's gonna give it a good fight because this is a very good a matchup between two great quarterbacks especially with them being at a, such a young age in their early to mid twenties, it's it's insane. And when it comes down to it, uh, we after moving past from our Super Bowl predictions, we head on to the NBA for our last topic of the day, and some trading chaos has happened this past weekend, as the Brooklyn Nets finally decided enough was enough, and sent Kyrie Irving out of there as they sent him to the Dallas Mavericks for Spencer Dinwiddie, Dorian Finney-Smith, and a draft pick. Even though the Lakers were very interested in him, they wanted to get him, but it seems like the Nets were asking for too much when they could have just sent Austin Reeves and Max Christie. Um, I don't know how damn bad you got to be to keep Austin Reeves and Max Christie over Kyrie Irving, but okay, you do you, I guess, Lakers. You do you. Uh, and by Lakers, I mean the front office because ain't no way LeBron would say no to getting Kyrie Irving in exchange for Austin Reeves and Max Christie. But I want to know your guys' thoughts on the trade and how it benefits both teams moving forward, considering a lot of chaos happened throughout Kyrie's time in Brooklyn. Yeah, I'll start us off by saying I didn't think there was a chance in the world he was going to go to the Lakers to begin with. Um, I just don't think the Nets front office wanted that to pass, nor do I think the league wanted to see that happen. Um, I will say I had talked about this earlier with a friend and I told him, even though it was not a smart move, I said Mark Cuban would probably do his best to satisfy the fans and giving Lucas some help. So he'd probably bring in um, another back court guy to kind of take the load off Luca. Here's my issue with the trade. You gave Luca another uh, some offensive help. I'll say your defense and your depth is non-existent, absolutely non-existent. You've you've 
if anything, you've made it more enjoyable for a fan. Sure, you can raise ticket prices, but you're still not going to win games. You didn't build a championship caliber roster, um, at least not to this point. You know, there still could be some moves to be made. You know, I look at the Raptors and I I see Pascal Siakam as a potential target that could be moved somewhere. OG Ananobi as well. Obviously, they don't want another back court, but that's just another team off the top of my head that could move around. Um, you look at the Clippers who are in buy now mode. Um, who kind of want to build because their whole uh, Kawhi Leonard, Paul George segment just isn't really working out. So it's interesting to see what they'll do as we approach the deadline. There's other teams that, you know, I've decided to back off trading. You know, the Jazz suddenly are like, yeah, we're not trading Mike Conley, Jordan Clarkson, or amongst other names. You know, we're just not moving them, not happening. So that's also weird to see. Obviously this morning, uh, the Heat traded Dwayne Dedman. That was kind of like a interesting look on the league but you know teams are making moves i'm glad that everyone's not stagnant or just thinking that they have all the pieces um to the pies one would say but you know it's good to see some movement i am more i will say this this will be my last thing i'll point out i am more upset that they immediately went to lebron to get his comments about the whole Kyrie trade <laughs> like like i didn't realize this man was the legitimate father of Kyrie Irving. Like he's his own man he, we don't need his thoughts and opinions on everything. And I mean, it should be silly to say that because we know the Lakers should have pursued them. But if anything, in my mind, him making a comment about that only kind of weakens the relationship between him and his already backcourt stars. Does that, does that kind of show him he doesn't already have the like respect to the guys sharing the backcourt with them or we'll take this back real quick on his team, I should say like, I, it just didn't seem like the smart smartest move, at least, especially if you want to, you know, make a playoff push and have this like team mentality. So I was kind of disgruntled with the way they handled that, but you know, teach their own. I'm not the script writer for the NBA this season. Um, looking at it from the Mavericks side, I I also don't like this trade because this could like very easily like turn into a disaster for Dallas, and I think has like like a five six percent chance of like working out how they think like in a championship and mainly because I say that is from my understanding Kyrie Irving still hasn't signed any kind of extension on the contract that Dallas picked up from uh Brooklyn which no. expires at the end of the season so yeah it's, no they haven't so he in theory he could just at the end of the season walk to Los Angeles, wherever. So knowing this, the Mavericks front office, they're making this kind of gamble yeah. on Kyrie leaving while sending, like you said, like when you don't really have depth and defend, you don't ha really have that many defenders and you send the, the good ones to Brooklyn, you, you're you fixing one problem, I guess, and creating another one. And it just seems like such a Kyrie Irving thing to do to just turn Dallas into like an unsalvageable disaster. And then four months later, be like, all right, I'm out. That just seems like something he would do. Like, um, so it's a, it's a huge gamble, I think. Um, with, I guess, high, high risk, high reward. It's kind of Mark Cuban's thing. He's like the businessman, but I, 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 I don't see many universes where this works out well for Dallas um looking at Brooklyn it I'm not really sure what what to feel I feel like more of this was like kind of them the human side of it just wanting to get rid of you know Kyrie Irving and because like their their owner has been just very petty with Kyrie Irving um if you if you've been paying attention and I, it just seems like he's just done um, more than more than wanting getting getting rid of him more than like a business decision. So I don't I'm not sure where that leaves KD at the end of the season or where it leaves the Nets now because they were kind of rolling before they were the, before Kyrie Irving pulled a Kyrie Irving at the beginning of this week. Um, so I don't I don't I don't know what where this leaves where this leaves Brooklyn. Are they competitive? Do they blow it up? I'm not sure. And they, I, I, they didn't lose, I'd say, but it just it puts them in a weird position, especially where they were a week ago. Mm -hmm. Now they're about to lose their. It could pot. They lost Kyrie Irving, and 
who knows what's going to happen to Durant. So it's, I'm not sure where it leaves them. Yeah. And when it comes to Dallas, I understand why they did this trade. They needed to give Luka some scoring help because Spencer Dinwiddie, as good as he is, he is inconsistent with with his scoring output, even though you always expect like 10 to 15 points at the very least from him. And then he has his occasional scoring outbursts, but it is inconsistent. And the, the Mavericks were looking for something more, more so, something they could rely on more often. And Kyrie Irving does provide that. It does come at the cost of the defense, which really is a, it's a, it's a very risky gamble, especially with Kyrie Irving on a contract on a contract year. He can leave at the end of the season, and I think he will, but we don't know for sure until he does that. And well, <laughs> uh, I remember it's not like the it's not the first time that the Mavericks have done something like this. They did this in. Uh, during the 2014-15 season when they got Rajon Rondo from the Boston Celtics, and he too was on a contract year. And they did it to help boost their chances at making a deep playoff run with Dirk Nowitzki. And as it turned out, they did not go that far. They lost in the first round to the Rockets. So it's not... Like, I understand why they did the move. I just don't think it will be that successful. And I do think they could be a first round out, if especially if they don't figure out how to fix that defense which as you said Zach it looks non-existent <laughs> and for Brooklyn's end of course I understand why they did it they decided to move on from the, the chaotic nature that Kyrie brought to the team since he got there especially this season and a little bit and a good chunk of last season with him sitting out a couple games because he did not take the vaccine but well Oh, all's well that ends well for Brooklyn as they do get a pretty good package. They get some pretty good pieces with Sandra Dinwiddie and Dorian Finney-Smith uh, who are more than capable to help round out their depth overall as they do look a little more better overall as a team. And well, Kevin Durant will might need to take more scoring load on himself because he no longer has that second option alongside him. That was Kyrie Irving. Uh, I think the Nets will still be a pretty good playoff team. I just don't think they'll be a, a title contender, especially after this trade happened. What and do you guys think happens at the end of the season with Brooklyn, though? Because, you know, the, you put all this money into the big three and it, it didn't work out all together, but you still have Kevin Durant under contract. So do you just blow it up or do you, you know, just throw your one last shot at it? Like, mm. I try think to win with Kevin Durant and try to build a just Kevin Durant and try to build around him because he's still I think it's 2026 or 2025 he's yeah he uh, under contract like, there um I do think Durant does end up asking to trade asking a trade out of Brooklyn I think he asked it himself unless Brooklyn does it for him but I think it's the former I think Kevin Durant will ask a trade out of Brooklyn after this season I, where I don't know but. Hey, our guess is, a good, is as good as anybody else's when it comes to Grant. Future Bulls legend. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would just say it, you could go either way with it from the ownership perspective, but obviously this was way more reliant on what Kevin Durant wants to do with his future. Because if he's not mentally in it for the Brooklyn Nets, uh, it's better to just ship him off and see what you can get in return for him. You know, you already got some decent pieces in Denwoody with um, – the whole shipping off of Kyrie. Um, obviously, you know, it's hard to, to bite the bullet per se when you had this big three and all of this super high expectations of being a championship or a dynasty per se. But, you know, sometimes you have to accept failures in some regards. You know, I'd if I were them, first of all, get Ben Simmons out of there. I don't care. I'm not sold on him as a player anymore. I think that project sailed long ago. You got to move on from that. Um, if you can get a big return for Kevin Durant, you know, I'd say go for it. You know, there's a ton of young talent, uh, in Phoenix. I know Phoenix wants to re-pursue their role with him in that regard. So if I were them, I would maybe entertain some of those deals. Um, but yeah, that's probably all I'll say about Kevin Durant. I did want to add one more thing in terms of the Dallas Mavericks, you know, if they really were serious about making a push, there's plenty of big men that are up on the auction block you know you look at uh noel who's on the pistons right now i know his 
numbers aren't great as of now, but that's just another big man that can help you in your backcourt, help you defensively a little bit. You know, if you want to bring in Kelly Olenek, who's done an exceptional job uh, on the Jazz up to this point, I think that would be a good add. Even Vanderbilt um, would be a good look at them as well. You know, there's plenty of teams that are looking to ship out players. It's just whether or not they want to take the right approach to it. Then again, I'm not Mark Cuban. I don't know what their best point is going forward you know they're they're not even certain with with what's been going on in the media lately they're not even certain if you know Kyrie's going to be there the full time which I think is a dumb conversation I'd hate to entertain it but you know I'm a big Luca fan I hope everything works out okay for him if we don't see him get at least a ring or an MVP I'm going to be very disappointed in how career how his career's turned out for the Mavericks and I think I think they still like are some sort of position to make another move for a big man, some defensive help. Cause it's not like they, they sold the house exactly to get Kyrie Irving. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't think, I don't think they're done. I think they're, they're still prime, maybe not a premier talent at big man that's available, but there's definitely, there's definitely space there. And I, I think they'll make him. I think you have to, because like, they're not the Mavericks front office. They're, they're not dumb. Like they're not like not seeing like the same things we are. So I'm, my thought process is if they make that move, there another one has to be coming, or they're just that, or they're just like not good at their jobs, which is a possibility. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll know as the season winds down. Is the first that's that's for certain. And for our last question regarding the NBA, um, LeBron James, even though it's possible that he might not do it uh, tonight, as of this recording, it's Tuesday as they are taking on the Oklahoma City Thunder at 10 p.m. on TNT. Um, it, there's a good chance, it, while it's possible that he doesn't do it tonight, there is a good chance that he will pass Kareem Abdul-Jabbar to become the NBA, NBA's all-time scoring leader. Uh, all he needs is 36 points to pass Kareem, and he sits alone at the top uh, when it comes to having the most points ever from an NBA player. So what do you guys think on how long LeBron has been doing this and how historic, like how incredible it is to see him get to this point at his career where he's at the top of, of an all-time scoring chart above Kareem of all, of all, of all players. Yeah. I'll start by saying um, it would be the biggest bag fumbling of all time. If he breaks the record against OKC, there's just way too many storylines if he breaks that in LA. So I can, almost guarantee you he will not be breaking it against the Oklahoma City Thunder. Um, so <laughs> let's get that out of the way. Number two, based on his career-wise, you know, you speak about like the longevity of his career, but, you know, usually in terms of longevity, that usually hurts your career numbers overall just because it's so hard to maintain being able that much of just putting, being able to put up that much output throughout how long his career has been. And, you know, I think he's what, top five in terms of, points per game numbers throughout his career no other person within the top 10 is in top 10 in assists except for him and I think he's well within that as well as rebounds as well so he's top 10 in pretty much every important statistical category there is so not only has he been playing for this long he's been extremely efficient for this long as well um you know I'm not going to get into the whole greatest of all time debate that's completely beyond me <laughs> and ignorant in my opinion but you know for me he's the best player I've ever seen watch personally it's been a pleasure to see him and what he's done so far. So for him to break this mark, in my opinion, it's de he's definitely going to use Kareem's skyhook move to break it. I just think I've seen him work on it too much in practice for him not to bring it out. I could totally see him driving to the left and just throwing a skyhook. I don't know why. I just see it happening. It's just – it would be the biggest, like, there you go, Kareem. I'm, <laughs> I'm the greatest scorer of all time. But I believe yeah. it because they have like problem, like not maybe not problems, <laughs> but Kareem and LeBron do not like each other. I'm not sure like the backstory behind it, but it, they're not like buddies off the court at all. Yeah, I completely agree. But yeah, that that's enough uh, me praising LeBron James. Um, but yeah, definitely excited for him to break it. Yeah, it'll, it'll definitely be an awesome moment. It's kind of crazy to think about that I'm about to turn 21 here soon. And there's like, never been a point in my life or at least where I'm like competent enough to understand like the game that like LeBron's not like looked at by like as like the greatest as, that's that's crazy I'm 21 and it 
all of the, my entire life, he's been at least been in the conversation. Like, like you said, that's that's a dead end. Could go on forever. It. It's not only that, like. It's just that, like, he's playing for this long. It's how he efficient and dominant, and. It, it's it's insane because it's it's I think it's kind of different than looking at like Tom Brady or something like that because Tom Brady's not like running like coast to coast and slam dunking. It, it it's crazy that he's this forty or pushing or pushing forty and he can move like this and score at such an efficient level. It's crazy and the fact that I've you know been able to grow up watching. Even like not even a Cleveland fan, or I, I don't I wouldn't call myself like a LeBron fan per se, but just being alive and being able to witness his amazing career is, um, it's crazy. And he did he did he did like I'm not a LeBron fan. Like I said, he doesn't get the love he deserves. I don't think. Yeah, like at the end of the day, uh, he does. He will go down as one of the greatest of all time. That is no debate. That's that doesn't need a debate. We know this. Whether he's better than Michael Jordan or not, anybody can anybody can make that argument. It's a fair argument to make, and it, it really doesn't matter because we know what he's capable of and all the accomplishments he achieved throughout his very illustrious career. And topping the scoring chart, passing Kareem, whether it be tonight against the Thunder or Thursday or against Milwaukee, which would be more poetic against one of Kareem's former teams. So I understand where you're going with Zach. I think it's possible that he doesn't pass it, which I think, I think, I think so too. I think he gets like 25, 30 points against OKC in a win and then take on Milwaukee and then he passes Kareem. I, I think that's what will happen. But no matter what, LeBron has done so much winning, winning championships, being on so many talented teams throughout his career. And well, it's just not much else to say besides he just continues to make history and passing Kareem to become the all-time scoring leader. It doesn't get much better than that. Yeah, my last thing I'll add, because I know we're running short on time here. The way I see it is he's going to have probably like 30 or 31 tonight to keep his average to be within the MVP running, and then he's probably going to break the record on his first shot next game. That, <laughs> that, that's how I see it going down. That way you get all the festivities out of the way early. Everyone knows what they signed up for. Everyone's happy. Yeah, for sure. With that, that'll be it for this episode of You Press Play Sports. Make sure to hit like and subscribe. Click the bell to keep up with notifications from us. Also, be sure to go on upressonline.com to keep up with news, sports, and more content alike. To follow us on Twitter, it's for me, at Rich26Pereira, for Cameron, at Priester Cameron, and for Zach, at ZachWatts1 underscore. Thanks for watching, everybody, and have a great day.